U.S. President Joe Biden has declared that the pandemic is over. The head of the World Health Organization also said recently that the end is in sight, but clarified days later that seeing the end doesn't mean we are at the end. However, medical experts and international public health officials seem to have different opinions on this. A senior WHO official also warned that richer nations must not step away from tackling COVID-19 as a global problem now ahead of future potential waves of infections, lest they have blood on their hands. Meanwhile, official data from the U.S. show on average 400 Americans are still dying from the virus each day and nearly one in five adults who had COVID were still suffering from long COVID. So where exactly are we in the fight against the pandemic and why is there such a, a stark difference in opinions? How serious is the lingering challenge of COVID and its long-term symptoms? I'm pleased to be joined from San Francisco by Dr. Peter Chin Hong, Professor of Medicine of the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, Peter, thank you very much for joining us. So, yeah, U.S. President Joe Biden said on TV that the pandemic is over. He was taking an interview with uh, CBS 60 Minutes. He said, we're still doing a lot of work on it, but the pandemic is over. And then he also referred to the crowd saying, if you notice, no one is wearing masks. Everybody is in pretty good shape. He said, I think it's changing. How do you interpret his remarks? Was he making a serious announcement or he was just saying something uh, because he was there, you know, just to please the crowd or, or, or some other statement that's that just came out at the moment? Well, I think he was speaking very colloquially and uh, not probably scientifically based. He was speaking from his heart, from the emotion. He was there at a trade show. We all want the pandemic to be over so that the economy can go on. But I think if you speak to scientists, there are two reasons why we don't think the pandemic is over now. The first is, of course, the number of deaths. Uh, even if we are in a lull right now in the United States, 400 people a day dying is, you know, 160,000 a year, which is several fold higher than even a regular flu season. Uh, second reason is we can't predict the future. We want it to be over, but until we see many, many months of very low level disease, we can't really say it's over because the only thing predictable about COVID is that it's unpredictable. Well, daily infections, as you mentioned, still hover around uh, 50,000 daily in the United States and uh, some 400 Americans still are still dying each day of COVID. So medically, how do you tell that a pandemic is over? I mean, what are what may be the criteria and how does one measure exactly where we are? Well, I think if you really speak to um, a variety of scientists, there is an epidemiologic definition, which is, uh, you know, not a large number of cases happening in multiple countries at the same time. But then there is a quality of life issue. And if you say it's impacting the quality of life uh, or it's not impacting, then you'd say it's over. But again, uh, it's really tough to say this when it's still happening all over the world at different rates and different people have different levels of immunity. For me personally, uh, we may be on the road as the Director General of the WHO said, but until we have many, many months, I can't really say for sure. This is a snapshot, not a longitudinal picture. Hmm. What, given the kind of mindset that Americans have right now about this virus, I mean, my understanding is that it's been so long, a lot of people are really quite tired, maybe, of the prevention measures, although a lot, and some people have got it repeatedly, but survived so far. So maybe there's a sense of fatigue and, and so on and so forth. But when the president is saying, even you know, just uh, not as a serious declaration that the pandemic is over. Do you think there will be serious implications, or it will just be you know just another day? Well, no, I think it will have m many implications. The first implication is, of course, symbolically, if you have the leader of the country saying it's over. I think a lot of people would jump on that bandwagon and not really be flexible in terms of bringing those masks back on or the testing when numbers increase. But the second reason, which I think is most important, is that to control a, a national emergency, you need money from the federal level. So if you say it's over, that gives a rationale not to 
give money uh, and it really boils down to who's responsible. If it's not responsible at the countrywide or federal level, it leaves it to the local governments to take care of in terms of who pays for mass tests, uh, early therapy, even vaccines, it's going to go on the free market probably in 2023. That means that people who don't have the ability to pay or no insurance would probably not be able to afford um, you know, additional boosters. Let me try to bring in uh, our other guest, uh, Dr. Eric Fagel Ding, epidemiologist and chief of the COVID task force of the World Health Network. Eric, if you're there, let me know, Eric. Yes, I can, I can hear yeah, you. Good, yeah, good, good. So, Go yeah, how do you look at the remarks by President Joe Biden that the pandemic is over? Do you think he made it as a serious declaration or is just a blur on the side? Do you think there may be possible policy changes as to, for instance, funding or resources that are dedicated to fighting COVID that may be diverted elsewhere? I think it's a very unfortunate comment. It was very... Um, ad lib, as in it wasn't planned, and none of his staff uh, was actually prepped. Uh, the coronavirus White House team actually did not know it was being made, and so they reiterated there's no policy change, mm. but they emphasized that the U.S. is out of pandemic funds for more uh, testing, for more treatments um, and vaccines uh, after, after this, uh, this fall. So starting 2023, basically, unless Congress authorizes new, you know, U.S. pandemic response will be severely handicapped. But as of now, there's no immediate change of policy mm. regarding the uh, COVID pandemic. All right. Uh, as I mentioned in the leading, there was a bit of a apparent flip-flop on the part of the World Health Organization as well. World Health Organization Director General Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus had a, a bit of explaining to do, it seemed, after he asserted in mid-September that the end of COVID pandemic is in sight, and then he had to clarify um, a week later saying, we can see the end in sight, in sight doesn't mean that we're at it. Um, what does he mean? So where exactly are we in terms of the fight against the against the virus, Eric? Now is that um, we are still really, really heading into a very dangerous winter. Um, and the winter right now is that there are so many new variants out there that are so penetrant against even our current vaccines, even the new bivalent vaccines, that we're, I think, potentially going to see an inevitable surge in um, late fall or winter time. And many countries are not prepared who are dismissing precautions. And, you know, we're actually less prepared than we have been in the last two winters because we actually have almost no mitigation whatsoever. And I think that is sets a, a lot of countries up for failure because we actually are taking care uh, against COVID even less than before. So, and I think it's going to hit us just like a tsunami, just like Omicron hit us last year, it's going to happen again. Well, Bruce Aylward, who is a senior advisor to WHO Director General, uh, also warned that richer nations must not step away from tackling COVID-19 as a global problem now. He said, if you go to sleep right now, God, blood will be on your hands. I mean, extremely strong words. So, yeah. yeah well taken but if you look at the realities on the ground in many countries for instance what we saw in the uk for instance during uh, a recent uh, a large scale gathering it seems that countries have already lifted restrictions or they are apparently given up on on doing something about to stop covid is are you or is the who sounding uh, useless alarm if i don't want to say exaggerated alarm eric no, I don't, I don't think these alarms are exaggerated. I think Bruce Hayward is very correct. There will be blood on uh, a lot of leaders' hands once winter comes because, you know, the mitigations are gone. And they're selling basically short-term economic gain for long-term pain in terms of long COVID and many other hospitalization, hospitals and other cancer and other heart attacks, uh, people who suffer at the same time. You know, they're really, really throwing them under the bus because right now all they care about is immediate growth, not the long-term impact. 
And I think you need good leadership that can see the long-term impact of this will come back to bite us, and we will uh, rue the day, and we will regret um, us completely mm. throwing caution into the wind. And I think that's what many countries are doing. And I think this it's a, again, for the third year almost, it's a pandemic of failed leadership. It, it's hard. It's incredibly hard. But uh, yeah, uh, Peter, to the challenge of uh, long COVID, the WHO said about 10 to 20 percent of people experience long COVID after surviving their initial COVID illness. And the U.S. government said long COVID has potentially affected up to 23 million Americans. Uh, is the threat, is the challenge um, being understood by the people? No, I think long COVID is so uh, invisible. It's in the background. Um, many people have it. They don't really know how to characterize it. There are a lot of disparities around long COVID because if you have access to care, you probably would get diagnosed. You may get some treatment. But if you don't have access to care, you just think you can't work uh, for whatever reason and you're not really sure. Uh, at the end of the day, we don't have a lot of information about it. Uh, there is, uh, you know, a billion dollars being uh, promised by the NIH to study this, but the studies are very limited right now. They're in its infancy. We don't really have good treatments. We don't even know how many people really have it, but what we do know is what you said, which is that uh, not only are millions of people affected by it, uh, there are probably two to four million people who are severely affected by it so much so that they are not in the workforce. We don't know when they will come back, um, but it's contributing to a, a, a big um, vacuum for the future when we have you know, problems even hiring people in the food industry and education and even healthcare when we have, you know, somebody said that uh, you know, uh, quitting is infectious right now because of all of these reasons combining burnout plus long COVID and chronic conditions. So, sorry, you say quitting is infectious? Yes. Okay, so it's Quitting not... your job. Oh, quitting your job is infectious. Um, what is your reaction to the comment that, uh, about blood on the hands? What is your reaction, I would like to know, Peter? Well, my reaction is similar to Eric's, which is that it's not a, it's not a, um, a far out comment. And the reason why is if you look at where variants were created, uh, they were really in unvaccinated, areas, so Delta in India, Omicron in South Africa, and unless the richer countries continue to help support the vaccine efforts in much of the world, um, you know, we are going to continue to see oh. variants uh, upend our, uh, our progress that we've made, upend hmm. and disrupt uh, the community and schools and work, uh, et cetera. So let's keep fighting the pandemic until it is really over. Many thanks to Dr. Peter Ching Hong, Professor of Medicine of the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of California, San Francisco, and on the phone from Washington by Dr. Eric Ding, Epidem epidemiologist and chief of the COVID Task Force at the World Health Network. With that, we come to the end of this edition of The Point. With me, Liu Xin, as always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Liu Xin in Beijing. On behalf of the whole team, thanks for watching. You've got The Point.